found in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The psalm is from Psalm 150, beginning with verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel readings found in the book of Luke, chapter 17, beginning with verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, He said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. And you can be seated, please. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are here with us. Lord God, you are here with us. Help us to be with you, Lord Jesus, as, as we hear you today, as we hear this word today. I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would open us and, uh, Lord, just to Help us to focus and be intentional and have purpose that you want us to have so we can follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I, I love that Jeremy just did this. This is not planned. Sorry. This is off script. So, But I, I, when it, people were raising their hands like that, and I love that, by the way. And uh, there's, lot, there's several reasons why you raise your hands in worship. Uh, one is that it's a physical thing that you can do, even if you can't... Uh, sing or speak, you can raise your hands if, if, if you're able to do that, right? And, and then another reason for that is, is when we raise our hands, or, or, or even one hand, you know, sometimes, it, it's us saying, Dad, pick me up, right? And, and so, like, when we raise our hands, if, if you come to the whole liturgy, it, it's Hosanna in the highest, and we raise our hands, it's, that means God save us, save us now. Pick, Daddy, pick us up. And the other thing is it's a blood covenant thing, and we're saying, God, we're with you. I belong to you. Whatever you say, I'll do it. And you raise your hands, and that's part of that. And it reminds me of Moses uh, when the Israelites were in battle, and he raised his hands. And while his hands were raised, the Israelites were winning. And when his hands dropped down, they started to lose. So Aaron and, uh, Aaron and Miriam raised his hands for him, right? And so when we, when we praise with raised hands, we're, we're really reaching, we're reaching out to God in a lot of ways. So never feel ashamed or embarrassed to do that. It's awesome. Um, Christ is risen. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. All right. So today's sermon is actually called Rise Up and Praise Him. Uh, like Barb said, we're doing Rise Up and for the next uh, few weeks. And next week we're doing Rise Up and Follow. Um, but today we're doing Rise Up and Praise Him for a reason. And I, I don't want us to, it's so easy to rush away from the cross and the empty tomb after Easter. Um, y- y'all showed up today, and that's awesome. The, the traditional word for the, week, the Sunday after Easter is called Low Sunday. It's, you know, Easter happens, and it's like, whew, where'd they go, you know? Um, but so I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Um, but I want to even go back back to the tomb, back to the cross. I want to go back to Palm Sunday. And something that Jesus said when the Greeks, there were a couple of Greek guys that showed up and wanted to meet Jesus. And Jesus, that was like a turning point. And Jesus said this to his disciples. <clears throat> Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Now that word love is not agape. It's actually philo. Uh, philo, philo. It means like Philadelphia. It's like brotherly love. It means to have regard for, to have affection for. So if you, in other words, if you regard your life the most, so anyone who has great affection for their own life, which most of us tend to do, will lose it. While anyone who hates, and that word is minos, it, it does, it can mean I hate you, which, but in this case, it also means to have less love for, or to have a, a low regard for. So whoever, um, whoever, while anyone who has no regard for their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And this is huge. Whoever serves me must follow me. We're going to talk about that next week. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So, yes, we're going to talk about following him next week, but something has to happen first. In order for us to follow him, we need, you see, he says, where I am, my servant also will be. So, is God always with us? Are we always with God? Right? If I'm honest, I know God's always with me, but I know in my heart and my head, sometimes I'm not with him. And we need to be with him. If we're going to follow him, we need to be with him. Hard to follow somebody if you're not with them, right? It's just practical lo- logistics. We need to be where he is. Do we go running off doing our own thing and expecting that Jesus is going to go do it with us? Or do, are we intentional? Do we have purpose? And we say, and we invite Jesus into what we do. And we invite Jesus to be master of everything that we do so that Instead of us pretending that we can actually lead him, we, f- we, we follow him. So we need to have that intentionality. And what we see in, uh, in, in 1 Peter, in this letter that Peter writes, is, is what it looks like, what, what uh, very intentional disciples looks, look like. And we're, we're going to be talking a lot about discipleship in the near future. <clears throat> and I know that that kind of like uh, freaks people out a little bit because we don't know what discipleship is. And a lot of people think discipleship mean, is the same as evangelism. And evangelism is like one really tiny part of discipleship. And if I can just nutshell what a disciple is, is a disciple is somebody who follows the master and wants to be just like them, right? So discipleship it, when you, you, know, you know you've done well as a disciple when people go, I know who your master is. I know because of what you say. I know because of how you act. You act just like him. You talk just like him. I know who your, who your master is. And that's discipleship. So don't be afraid of it. It's a process, okay? And we'll be, we'll be really moving into a season of discipleships coming up here. But um, where do we start with all this stuff? And Peter is writing this letter to a bunch of Christ followers. They're Jewish Christ followers. And they're under massive evil persecution. They're being slaughtered. They're running for their lives because they have to. 
in a, in a foreign land where they have very few or, or no friends. And Peter's writing to this, these people and he's say, encouraging them and he's saying, look, when you gave your lives to Christ, you may not have expected this, but God knew who you were. Before you were born, he knew you. Before you were conceived, he sanctified and ordained you to have a purpose. And he knew that you would be the Christ followers during this time and that you would be amazing ambassadors for Jesus in this strange world that you're now moving into. And you're going to be, he knew that you would be just right to handle this persecution and to, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ into the world. And so that's what, what he's writing about. But he wants to keep them from getting lost, not just geographically, but in intention and in purpose. And so this is what he says to them. And this should really, he says, the end of all things is near. Is that ringing a bell for anybody? The end of all things is near. Can I, let me, let me, if the end of all things was near 2,000 years ago, is it nearer now? <laughs> yeah, it kind of has to be, right? And so if the end of all things is nearer now than it was 2,000 years ago, in my mind and in my heart, I feel like what the Word of God says is 2,000 times more important now than it was 2,000 years ago. Because it's near, Right? So we need to be fired up. And, and Paul, Peter writes to these people and he says, the end is near. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Because the end is near, right? Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. How do you stay on, on focus? Pray. But you can't play with, pray with a muddled mind. You've got to be clear-minded. Above all, Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Hard to hold a grudge against somebody when you really, really love them, right? So we love each other deeply. Offer hospitality to one another. Oh, this is the hard part. Without grumbling, right? Don't just serve and love, love without grumbling, right? If you're going to do it, do it with joy or or. Maybe don't do it. I don't know. Do it, but. <laughs> Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In other words, never forget where it came from. Every, every good thing that you are. Every potential, every promise, every possibility. It's God's grace and it, it's a gift. So it's his. Give it. He's got more to give you. Just give it. He does, he, you can't outgive God. Just give, give him your life to him. If anyone speaks, I love this, the power of this, they should speak, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. Makes you think about what's going to come out of your mouth, doesn't it? When you speak, speak as, as though God is speaking right through your mouth. Wow, that, that puts a cap on a lot of the things I think I'm going to say. Right? If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that, Paul is so, I mean, Peter's so clear, so that, what's, the, what's it all about? So that in all things, God may be praised, it all comes to praise, doesn't it? may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So there's all this intentionality. There's all this focus so that we don't get lost. We stay following Jesus. And what it all starts and boils down to, this kind of focused, intentional discipleship, it starts and stays with praise. It starts and stays with praise. When you're praising God and you're thinking about who he is and what he does and what he's done for you and you're praising him and praising him, it focuses everything. So how do we praise? How do we praise? Uh, in the words of Inigo Montoya, I think that's his name. 
Let me explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. Right? How do we praise? This is Psalm 150 in a nutshell. Praise him everywhere, all the time, any way you can, with everything and anything you got. Sorry about the grammar. Praise him with everything you got. Anywhere, all the time, with everything you got. Praise him. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in the heavens, in his heavens, and his sanctuary, and everywhere in between. It all belongs to him. If you can blow a trumpet, blow a trumpet. If you can't blow a trumpet, pluck a harp. If you can't pluck a harp, bang something together and make a joyful noise to the Lord. Dance for him if you can't make any noise. But praise him because he's done great and powerful things and he deserves to be praised. So praise him. Praise the Lord. Praise him with everything you got. That's why we're here. That's why we were made. Our number one purpose. We were formed for his pleasure. Us and everything in the universe formed for his pleasure, and we're the ones who are best at expressing it. We've been given the, uh, the ability to be the best to express it. So we need to do it. It's never a mistake to start with praise, all right? So today, we read what happened with the, these 10 lepers, and Jesus is walking between the border of Galilee and Samaria, and it happens no coincidences, but he happens to, to come up, up, up near these, these 10 lepers. And what's great about this story uh, is it tells us a lot about us, and it tells us some, something really important about Jesus, okay? So I want to point out a few things that it tells us about us. And first thing we need to know about us is we need community. We need community. Um, but misery loves company. Okay, we need community. I am probably one of the most introverted people you will ever meet in your life in this world. That's actually true. But even I, even though I could go and live in a cave for three months and be happy, I need community. We, need, we all need community. We need it. But we will find it any way we can get it. And that's not always healthy but sometimes it's necessary. And so I was thinking back to just two years ago, just two years ago when all this uh, pandemic broke out. And we even, we even needed a letter. We had to have a letter handy uh, to come to church. We, were assen- we considered essential workers in this state. So we had a letter that if we got pulled over, we could actually say, here, we're on our way to, to work. We're essential workers. And so as we came to work and, and we found, what, we, what did we do? We all did it. We, f- we found out who was in our contamination pool. Who do I hang out with? Who do I work with? Who are, who are the people that I see every day? And that became our community. Right? I don't, is that what happened to you? That's what happened to me. That's what happened to these lepers. Right? Because Jews hate Samaritans and Samaritans hate Jews. But when they got leprosy, they kind of forgot about all that. And so you have this community that they built around their sickness. Do we do that? We build community around our sickness. That's what they did. That's kind of what they had to do. They were kind of forced into it. That was their contamination pool. These guys had to follow some really interesting uh, purity laws. The Samaritans and the Jews, they had the same laws about this stuff. And if you had any kind of skin disease, and they call just about any kind of skin disease leprosy at that time, although it is a very specific disease, but back then, anyway, you had to stay a minimum of 16 feet away from anybody who didn't have a skin disease. So guess what they had to practice back then? (laughs) Social distancing, physical distancing, right? But 16 feet minimum. And if you saw anybody coming... Like they saw Jesus coming. They, what they were supposed to say was unclean, unclean, unclean. And warn the people that they had skin disease. They had this leprosy. But instead, what, what did they say? Master, have mercy. Save us. What they were supposed to say was unclean. They also were required to wear a covering around their mouths. Now, I'm not saying that what we went through in any way compares to having the disease of leprosy. However, there's some things that cross over, 
right? And how can you imagine living like, well, you can, I think, imagine living like this all the time. I don't know if this happened to you, but this is what hap- this happened to me on multiple occasions in the early days of the pandemic. And we had to, we, we were masked. We had to have uh, six feet distance between each other. And if you felt sick, you were supposed, you're supposed to stay home. That's good practice, right? So here I am in the supermarket and we're all being very careful, not touching things that we don't have to touch. And I got a little saliva that goes down my windpipe. So I know I'm going to cough. And I feel like I should have a megaphone that, and say, excuse me, shoppers. I am going to cough now. I'm not contagious. Got a little bit of saliva down the windpipe. Don't be afraid. It's just that kind of a cough. Don't worry. I'm going to cough, but it's not contagious. Don't worry. And then you cough, and by the time you're done coughing, it's like a ghost town. <laughs> and everybody's disappeared. But, but that's what, that isn't, that is how they lived their whole lives all the time. And there was, n- for them, there was no hope of going back, of, of having their old community back. And that what we find out, we like it when it feels normal. We, f- we find, from this text, we find out, we, we like it when it feels normal. Because they built themselves a community. And we did, we did the same thing. We, we started fist bumping and elbow chicken winging and um, air hugs. We did all this stuff. We, we had to out of necessity. And, but whenever we compromise, and this is true across life, the pandemic just brought out things that are true, that's all. When we, when we do this stuff and we compromise, we call it the new normal. And in our hearts, what we really want is the old normal. But in reality, what we really need is not the new normal or the old normal. We need new life in Jesus Christ. And we need to live a kingdom life on earth as it is in heaven. Whether we're sick or not, whether we're oppressed or not, whether we're persecuted or not, whether we have to deal with something that, 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 uh, that's a nuisance or not, and protect, you, you do things for the benefit of other people, but what we really need is new life in Jesus Christ. And so these guys made their own new normal, but when Jesus showed up, what, what else we found? When Jesus shows up, the truth comes out. When Jesus shows up, the truth comes out. And when they realized that there was a chance that they would be healed, and they saw Jesus coming, they, they, you know, basically it was, you know, guys, it's been really great hanging out with y'all. But I want to be healed and go back to my family. I want to be healed and go back into society. I want to be healed and go back into life. And, and, and usually that's as far as we can think. We think of going from the, the new normal back to the old normal. But when Jesus shows up, Jesus doesn't care about the new normal or the old normal. What he wants is to give us new life in him. And that's reality. That's reality. That's what we really need. And so when Jesus shows up, the truth comes out. And we cry out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. And he does. And to them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And so they they went. They obeyed him. They went to show himself to the priests. And what else do we learn about us from this? When we pray for mercy and we get mercy, we almost instantly forget who gave it. I mean, the half, nine out of ten. When we pray for mercy, we get mercy. We almost, it takes us seconds sometimes to forget who gave it to us. But when we praise him, when our, when our regular posture, when our, norm, when our discipline, when our habit is in, always and in, in everything, with everything you got all the time, anywhere, praising him, you never forget. You never forget who showed you mercy. You never forget. 
That's why praise matters so much. And so 10 went walking, 10 got healed, one came back, and what we found out about Jesus is that praise matters to Jesus. God the Father being glorified for showing love and mercy to us matters to Jesus because he loves us and he wants to be one with us. And when he, and when he takes us as his own and by, by his own blood washes us clean and makes us new, he wants to be one with us all the time. And, and without that posture of praise, it's so easy to get lost. So easy to lose direction. But when we're praising him, oh, we, we, we stay one with him. You know who we were on Good Friday? Who were we on Good Friday? Were we sick? We're sick. Sin sick. Sick in our souls. Dying bodies. No hope. But Jesus, Jesus goes to the cross for us. Jesus sheds his blood for us. Jesus pours out his love for us. And he says, you know what? You can't be the way you need to be so I can have you forever, but I can make it so you can be so I can have you forever. Here, I love you this much. I do anything for you. I pay any price for you. You're the, you're the pearl that God sold his greatest treasure to get. You're the treasure in the field that God sold his greatest treasure to get. You belong to him. Give yourselves to him. Love him. Say, have mercy on me, and he will give you new life. Because we were all like the lepers on Good Friday. But by Sunday morning, we should know that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We needed mercy. Jesus showed us mercy on that cross. And on Sunday, he rose to prove it. He loves you that much. If you want to be focused, if you don't want to get lost, if you want to follow him, praise him. When you turn around, like the one... Now, there were a billion reasons, excuses, why the nine kept going and the one came back. And I could sit here and say, well, you know, they were obeying Jesus, but the Samaritan had nowhere else to go and make excuses. Ten got healed, one came back. Are you, don't, be, don't be the nine, right? Be the one. Turn, when you turn around and come back to him and you praise him, that is when you're with him and he's with you and you're doing what you were made to do, your God-given purpose, you're giving praise and glory to God. And when we praise him, that's when his mercy and his power become very clear to us and focused, and we become intentional. So stop and turn around and come back to him, fall at his feet, praise him, worship him, love him. He died for you, was buried for you, he rose for you. You're clean because of him. So I want to invite you now to, to stand up and pray a, a clear-headed prayer of praise with me. And nobody has to do it. Nobody forces anybody to do anything around here, but if I encourage you, invite you to pray with me, and then let's, pray, let's rise up and praise Him. Right? Let's pray. Father God, we praise You for the love that You have for us. Jesus Christ, we praise You for the mercy You have shown us. Holy Spirit, we praise you for making us one with Almighty God. We praise you for your plans and your purpose for us. We praise you for your loving kindness and forgiveness. We praise you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made with a destiny that pleases you. Praise Jesus. Amen. Let's, let's praise him.